Go ahead and grab your Bibles, if you would. Turn to the book of Matthew. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. We've been looking at that book uh, on and off uh, for the last several weeks. So if you take the book known as the Holy Bible, and if you've got those that are here, it would be underneath the seats in front of you. Um, It's going to be about three quarters of the way through. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament, and it's the first book of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, so Matthew chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 18 through 22 as we get started. If you're still hunting and you've got one of the Bibles here, it's page 958. You can go ahead and flip to that page if you'd like. So this is Jesus in the calling of the first disciples. Here's what it says. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Verse 19, come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and followed him. At once, they left their nets and followed him. And yes, I'm going to do it a third time. At once, they left their nets and followed him. Verse 21, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, verse 22, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And yes, you guessed it once again for the third time, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. How many of you, when you were a little whippersnapper, um, left for whatever reason, you moved away from your childhood home, the home that you grew up in? If that describes your situation, put your hand up. Yeah, it's a number of us, right? Many of us have had to leave for whatever reason. See, what may have been difficult is that there was a shift that had to be made, right? You had to shift from here, where you knew, where you were, right, to there, where you didn't know. The here was what you knew, the there was what you didn't know. And at some point, maybe with a lot of anxiety, maybe with a lot of fear, a, a lot of uh, and, you know, dread, perhaps, you had to make that shift. You had to sacrifice, if you will, what you knew, the here. And as you got used to the there, however, you see what happens? You move from here to there. And as you move from here to there, you get used to the new there. And then pretty soon the here just kind of vanishes. It just kind of fades. Now you never forget, but the pull that the here had on you is no longer there. Do you see what I'm saying? And the there becomes the new norm for you. So we're making a shift as a church aren't we? We, as a church, are moving from here to there, and we're doing so out of obedience to the Holy Spirit who is leading us and who is directing us. Why? Because it's time for us to advance the mission of the church. What is the mission? Part of it says that we are committed to making disciples through reaching our community with a life-changing message of Christ's love. And this is why we're making the shift from one service to two services, because we want to reach our community. We want to reach our community more effectively than we do presently, right now, so that we can help make more disciples, so that we can follow what God's command is for each of us. And therefore, in order for that to take place, we are willing to disadvantage ourselves for the advantage of others. We're willing to spend more of our money, to give more of our money. We're willing to serve more and give more of our time, right? And so we are shifting to worship one, serve one. And we're doing so for the sake of the gospel. Why do we gather as a church? Is it because some guy likes people to stare at them every week? No. Why do we gather as a church? Is it because we want to hear a really good band perform every week? Okay, that's a good thing, but that's not, I hope, why we gather. Why do we gather? We gather as a body of believers. Why? To understand Jesus' love for us. 
to get into the word and understand what scripture teaches us so that we have a foundation for life, right? We gather together to celebrate the presence of our almighty God. That's why we gather, and we want to share that with others. We don't want to keep that to ourselves, right? We do it so that lost and broken people can see the gospel through us. We do it so that lost and broken people can hear the gospel as it's lived out and as it's spoken in kind words and loving welcome, right? We do it, why? Because we want lost and broken people to experience the gospel as we serve them and as we serve one another, folks. We do it because we know that this life is not all there is. This life is temporary. It's just a stopgap. That's all this life is. This life is a precursor to eternity. And we keep our eyes focused on what's really important. And it's not what happens this morning. It's not what's going to happen later today. It's not what happens next week. What's really important is where we go after we live this life. And that's why we sacrifice today. Because we have an eternal significance that we are looking at. We have an eternal destination that we want people to experience. And if that means that I give a little more of my time and my resources, so be it. My goodness. It's not about what's comfortable for us. It's about what is it going to take to reach them. Right? Are we together? Are we in agreement? That was really lame. <laughs> Are we in agreement? Yeah. Good. So let's walk this through. What is this going to look like starting in two weeks? I'm just going to use the word John. Pretend that you are John, all right? Think about this as this. All right, here's, here, here's how it works. Today, when John is scheduled to serve on a Sunday morning ministry, he shows up at 10 o'clock in the morning, and he serves until 12 o'clock. He misses the service, but he knows that his sacrifice glorifies God. It helps to fulfill the mission, and it enables spiritual growth within himself and those within his church family and the guests that are coming, many of whom are being introduced to the love of Jesus for the very first time. And so he does so. He serves gladly. And he can also watch the sermon online, so that's always good, right? But starting October 16th, in two weeks... John is scheduled to serve in a Sunday morning ministry, and so he shows up at the ungodly hour of 8.30. Oh, no. <laughs> I have to get up that early. Yeah, okay. So he shows up at 8.30. He serves until about 10.30, okay? Afterward, he heads to the lobby to grab a cup of coffee and a donut, and he chats briefly with a few fro folks from the first service before they head out. And then some friends from his community group show up. They arrive for the second service, with some friends that they brought with them because their friends worked the night shift and wasn't able to come earlier, okay? And after chatting for a couple minutes, they all head to the ministry center to get some great seats together. John is grateful. He gets to give of himself to help fulfill the mission and the ministry of his church family by serving, just as the rest of the church body does. And he is also being served by them during the second service. It adds a couple hours to his Sunday mornings, but he knows that his sacrifice glorifies God, it helps to fulfill the mission, and it enables spiritual growth within himself and without, within others in his growing church family, and so he does so gladly. So there's a little visual for you of where we're headed, okay? Now look, practically speaking, I'm not naive. Practically speaking, I know that this is a challenge more so for some people in a stage of life than other people in a different stage of life, i.e. young parents, parents with young children. I know this is going to be an interesting change and transition. I understand that. It's going to be a little challenging. It's going to be uncomfortable. People don't like change, period. Let's just say it, right? Don't mess up my schedule, please. Okay, well, guess what? God has a way of messing up our schedules. And so that becomes a new schedule. We move from here to there, right? Here is comfortable. There is uncomfortable at first. But eventually, the there which was uncomfortable becomes the new norm. As we stretch ourselves and as God in his wisdom stretches us and challenges us to do something different than we've done before for his glory, we say, yes, God, and then we try to figure it out later, right? 
Sometimes we have to just say, yes, how high do I jump, Lord, right? If God is behind it, he will work it out. Now, does that justify laziness and lack of preparation? Of course it doesn't. I hope you understand that, that I know that too, right? But we have to be willing to obey no matter what. Again, let's remember why we're doing this. It's the gospel. We have to make a shift within our own minds. We have to shift from a mindset of the church exists for me to a mindset of the church exists to be salt and light in this world. Yeah? Why do we exist? Somebody tell me. Thank you. Who just said, yeah, who just said that? Thank you, Peter. Peter was listening. Congratulations, you get the $100. <laughs> we exist to be salt and light. Jesus said you are the light of the world, right? Amen. He said be salt of the earth, right? Amen. So we need to be out there, and we need to share the great news of Jesus. Now, I know this is tough. I know this is difficult. Because for us to be here and to go from here to there... can be difficult. I know, I know, it's, you can't see it. Okay, see? Can you see now? And this right here says, this is for Cheryl's benefit. No, just, all right. So just trust me, it says here, and it says there, okay? To go from here to there can be difficult. So let's talk about the here. Let's talk about the here for a few minutes. The commitment level. What is the commitment level to stay here, to stay where we are? Generally speaking, it's comfortable, right? It's known. Am I right? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's, e it's easier. It's, it's the status quo, right? It's, it's familiar. It's consistent. It's predictable, okay? But how does that translate? If we were to stay here, right where we are, how does that translate to, if you will, kingdom expansion? God is expanding his kingdom, right? He wants us to be more and more effective at reaching lost and broken people with the gospel. We don't want to turn people away because we're too full, right? So if we stay here, what does that do to kingdom expansion? It, it holds it back as far as what God is calling us to do, right? Now, the whole kingdom doesn't hang on our church, but each church needs to be obedient, right? It needs to do what God has called us to do, each of us, okay? So if we stay here, it restrains the kingdom expansion, okay, as far as we're concerned, right? It holds it back. It, it, it limits it, right? Um, if, if we keep things the way they are, I mean, we've got very little traction. We're not really going anywhere, okay? We're kind of stuck here. We're, here is underfunded. Here is understaffed. It's time to go there, right? It's time to go where God wants us to go. So let's look at the there. What is the commitment level for there? More commitment, more, yep, yep, okay, yeah, more action. It's unfamiliar for sure. It's unpredictable. There's more, more what? More sacrifice, right? More sacrifice of time, uh, right? It, ex it requires us, okay, this, this there requires us to, uh, to change our mindset. The way we look at church, it needs to change, right? Our priorities, perhaps, are going to need to change in order for us to go there, okay? But what about the kingdom expansion of there? Growth, sure. Greater impact, greater influence, perhaps, if God would have it, right? A greater sense of purpose, a greater sense of enthusiasm, more ownership, again, more growth, we've already talked about that, more transformed lives, folks. There, there is the harvest. There is where we need to go. There is where God is calling us in faith to go. Why? Because we can't stay here anymore. We can't. It's not an option for us. We can't stay here. Why? Because here is unsustainable. We're not reaching the people that God has given us, and we have to get busy, folks. 
We have to get moving. God is giving us an opportunity to be part of expanding his kingdom through this local body of believers, folks. And we have to make this shift. We have to make this shift as a church. But we can only do so if that shift first takes place within each of us personally. There has to be a shift that takes place within each of us. You know, Jesus required and requires a pretty major shift from his followers. Turn to Luke. I already told you Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Let's go to the third one. It's page 1027. Luke chapter 9, verse 61 and verse 62. Jesus had this run-in, if you will, to uh, a bunch of uh, potential followers, and they said, hey, you know, we'll do anything you want, Jesus. You know, we want to follow you. And then Jesus would respond with these really interesting responses. And here's one of them. Luke 9, verse 61. Still another, one of Jesus' potential followers, said, Hey, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. That sounds fair enough, doesn't it? I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go say goodbye to my family. And look at how Jesus responds. Verse 62, Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Ouch. I mean, if you read that, right? Okay, so, hey, let me go say goodbye to my family. I'm going to ditch them for the rest of my life, perhaps. Let me at least go say goodbye. And Jesus wouldn't have it. Sounds like he's a dictator. Sounds like he's awfully mean, right? Again, remember, Jesus is God, and so he knows the heart of people. He knows what's really going on. And obviously, Jesus really knew that this potential follower of his was very reluctant We don't know the tone of voice. We don't know his life situation. Jesus knows everything, right? Jesus knew that this man was perhaps not willing to put something, um, you know, behind him. Jesus knew that, you know, that this, you know, that this man was willing to put someone or something ahead of Jesus. And what was he saying here? What was Jesus saying? Jesus was saying clearly that our service, serving, in the kingdom cannot be put off in pursuit of other matters. There is nothing more important than serving the world that God has put us in, folks. Serving in the kingdom of God is so important that Jesus expects his followers to make it their top priority. Jesus wants to be in first place, not second, not third, not 25th, Jesus wants to be number one in the lives and must be number one in the lives of his followers. And that's it. You can't put off the kingdom advancement because we have other more important pursuits that we are running after. We have to step out in faith to serve him without looking back. And this, again, is why we are stepping forward with two services. This is why we're doing it. It's in faith. Do we have everything figured out? No, we don't. Have we figured out as much as we possibly can? Yes. But the rest is going to be up to the Lord. It's going to be up to God to make it happen. We can't stay here. Why? We can't stay here because Jesus requires total devotion from his followers. Jesus requires total devotion, not half-hearted commitment. We have to count the cost and we have to be willing to abandon everything else that gives us security. Nothing should distract us from service for the kingdom. Now, let me just give you an analogy. Can I do that? Lighten things up. Ready? Make the connection. Are we good? How about you guys? When Rebecca and I got married, something happened. I gave up something. When I married this woman, I had to give up something. Unbelievable. I had to give up all the women chasing after me. No. (laughs) Whatever. Right. Okay. So I gave up, when we got married, I gave up pursuing any other woman so I could focus my love on her and her alone. I chose to sacrifice the hordes of females. No. Um, (laughs) Right? So what's the point? The point here is that, you see, our marriage covenant 
The covenant that, that we made together, my covenant with her is, is a promise. My promise was to be totally devoted to her, to focus my love on her and her alone. Now imagine how ridiculous it would have been if we were standing at the altar, right, going through the marriage vows, the whole thing, right, and I said this, I said, honey, Rebecca, I really love you, but I'm going to leave my options open. (laughs) I'm going to set aside some room in my heart to love someone else as well, okay? All right. She didn't even know how to box back then, but she would have knocked my head right off my shoulders. (laughs) Gone. No, it's ridiculous. Isn't it ludicrous to even think of that? Yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you know, some room for someone else to love down the road. That would be absolutely ridiculous. But folks, here's the point. We do this with God all the time. We do this to God all the time. We are unfaithful to God consistently. Oh, Lord, I will serve you, I promise. Unless, Lord, I will serve you unless it is just too inconvenient. Lord God, I will serve you unless I'm too tired I will serve you gladly, God, as long as I'm not too busy or I have something else that I'd rather do. Lord, I will love my neighbor unless they hurt my feelings. Lord God, I promise that I will give financially to your church in a consistent, sacrificial way as long as there's money left over after I pay the bills and I, you know, have all my blow money. And I'll serve your church, Lord, as long as I feel like it. Folks, Jesus requires total devotion. His church is plan A. There is no plan B. The church is the hope of the world. Why are we sitting on our butts? You know, the disciples demonstrated total devotion to Jesus. Do you remember the first passage in Matthew? At once, they left their nets. There's so many questions I have about that. What? At once? At once they left their nets and they followed him. What does it mean, at once they left their nets? Their nets, that was their livelihood, that was their career, that was their job. They gave it up, their source of income. They walked away from their family, that's another discussion. But they put God first in every possible way you can imagine. Is that what God is asking, by the way, for you to desert your family? No, again, that's another discussion. Jesus called them and immediately... They left the boat and their father and followed him. Each of the disciples immediately left behind all they knew to obey Jesus, to fulfill a greater call. Did you catch that, though? Did you catch that? To make the shift from here to there. Obeying Jesus came first for the disciples. They had to surrender They had to forsake, if you will, the here in order to fulfill their God-given destiny, the there. Just like the first disciples, each of us has to be totally devoted to Jesus, totally and completely, even if it doesn't make sense financially, if it doesn't make sense based on our schedules. We need to listen to what Jesus is calling us to. Several weeks ago, I shared that the number one goal that all of us needs to have is that we learn to hear his voice, that we can hear when God is leading us, and that requires a close, intimate relationship with him. But think about it. If we can hear his voice, and we we hear his voice because we're close enough to him where we can, it means that we know his character, and we can trust him. And if he asks us to do something ludicrous, something physically or relationally or what have you, impossible. We know that he will provide the means for us to to obey him. So we serve him with abandon, folks. We have to leave the here of a self-focused life and go there to a kingdom-focused life. Folks, the call to move from here to there for Christ's followers was really an invitation to a loving relationship. Folks, The love of Jesus is so beautiful. Have you embraced it? Have you experienced it? Have you been embraced by it? The love of Jesus is so beautiful, it's so real, and it's what enables authentic Christ followers to leave the comfort and the convenience of the here and journey to the unknown of the there. 
Henry Nouwen says this in one of his books. He says this, quote, I cannot continuously say no to this or no to that unless there is something 10 times more attractive to choose. Saying no to my lust, my greed, my needs, and the world's powers takes an enormous amount of energy. The only hope is to find something so obviously real and attractive that I can devote all of my energies to saying yes. I'm going to read it again so you listen and you can hear this. I cannot continuously say no to this or no to that unless there is something 10 times more attractive to choose. Saying no to my lust, my greed, my needs, and the world's powers takes an enormous amount of energy. The only hope is to find something so obviously real and so obviously attractive that I can devote all of my energies to saying yes. Wow. Is Jesus ten times more attractive to you? Than the here in your life. Let me ask you this. What is the here for you? Where is your here? Is it your comfort zone? Is it your habitual responses? Is it the familiar? What comes natural? Is that your here? Is it what's safe? Is it your reactions? Is it your assumptions? Is it cycles of sinful behavior? That's your here? That's where you're stuck? You can't stay here. God has a much better destination for you. And finally, we must go there. We must, we can't stay here, we must go there. Folks, again, our church is shifting to two services so that we can lead more people to leave here and to embrace Jesus. Go there. Exciting days are ahead. I mean, we get to do this. This is a privilege that we all get to celebrate together with and enjoy together. I hope all of you will be part of making this destination a reality. I hope that's your desire. I hope you want to jump on board and be part of what God is going to do. He's going to do it with or without us. I want want it to be with me. I want to be part of a movement. I want to be part of a revival that God wants to bring upon us. I want to be in the middle of what God is doing. The only thing that separates Here, from there, is the cross. The only thing that separates here from there is the cross. Folks, the ultimate journey that we all must make is to move, all of us, to move personally from here, a life without Jesus at the center, to there, and that's a life with Jesus at the center. God is calling you from where you are to where he is. Can you hear him? Are you listening? You might not know where that is yet, and that's okay. You might not know where that is, but you can know the one who's calling you, and you can trust in his character for who he is. Just like we don't know everything that's going to happen with this two-service move. We don't know. We're going to be taking notes the first several months and tweaking things as we go. We don't know all of the outcomes, but we do know the one who is leading us to go forward. We do know the one whose character we can trust. So as we get ready to close, I want to ask you this. Where is the there that God is leading you personally? Where is the there that God is leading you to? Is he leading you to be a missionary? Is he leading you to be a pastor, to to serve your church family? Are you listening? Can you hear his voice? In order to get from here to there, folks, this is the question. What is it that God is asking you to leave behind? What is it that he's asking you to leave behind? Is it comfort? Is it convenience? I don't know. But I know God does. And I want to challenge each and every one of us to take a moment and to reflect on that. What is God asking me to leave behind in order to be part of the movement that he's bringing about within us? as a body. Can you bow your heads with me? If you're here this morning, and and let's just say that, you know, you've, you've not made a decision ever 
to receive Jesus. And this is kind of new for you. And you haven't maybe thought of some of the things that we've talked about. But you know what? You are saying now, because the Holy Spirit is leading you and he's speaking to you, and you are ready to say, God, I surrender. I don't understand this. I have no idea how you're going to take the sin out of my life and cleanse me and make me whole. But I'm willing to trust you. I'm willing to trust that when you died on the cross, you paid the price for my sin, which needed to be paid. It needed to be paid because sin equals death, according to Scripture, according to the will of God. God cannot look at sin. And maybe you're here and you're like, you know what, I want to surrender my heart. I want to yield myself to Jesus. And you've never prayed a prayer to receive him. It's not a magic, it, the prayer is not magic, it's just a position of your heart, the posture of your heart. If you are yielding yourself to him and you want to surrender and live your life for him, I want you to put your hand up right now with no one looking around, just out of respect. You've never made this decision before and you want to yield your heart to him. If you're here today and you're realizing, man, I don't understand how this is going to work, but God is my Savior, but he's opened my eyes to something today. He wants me to move from here, and he wants me to move there. And that's scary, but I'm going to take a step in faith with the help of my church family. If that's you, and you're willing to go there without understanding everything, I want you to put your hand up to say, I'm willing to go there wherever God wants me, wherever I need to go to be part of what God is doing. Praise God. Let me pray for you. Jesus, we love you so much. God, I want to pray right now for those that raise their hands. I I thank you, God, that you are constantly stretching us, constantly uh, uh, leaning on us, God, to bring us to a deeper level of, of spiritual growth and maturity. God, we want to be your people. We want you, Lord, to use us the way that you desperately want to use us. So we yield our hearts to you, God. We ask that you'd reveal whatever it is that we need to leave behind so that we can jump on board the train that you're on, the move that you are making, God. Speak to us. Give us the strength and the capacity that we need in order to obey you, and we will give you all the glory that you are due. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.